Connecticut's unemployment rate is still over 8 percent. And yet there are industries in the state that cannot find people to fill vacant jobs. In his State of the State address last week, Governor Malloy told legislators that in many places, Connecticut's schools are failing to teach students the kinds of skills and knowledge they need. As I traveled around the state last summer on my jobs tour, nothing was more frustrating than a refrain I heard from too many employers. They said, I have job openings, but I can't find workers in Connecticut with the skills to fill them. The reason? A lack of competence in the STEM areas science, technology, engineering, and math. Today we begin a special week-long investigation of the problem starting with WNPR's Harriet Jones. This is the shop floor at Peter Paul Electronics in New Britain, a factory that builds solenoid valves. Judy Sprida is the human resources manager here. She's the one who sees new hires, usually high school graduates, come in through the door. They're very lacking in basic math. They're lacking in problem solving. They're lacking. The only way I can describe it is they don't know how to go to work. She says this company has plenty of work, but increasingly no one to do it. We have a setup man in his 70s. We have an assembler who is 76 years old. You know, these people are getting ready to retire, and there's nobody there. So we need to do something quickly. And Peter Paul is typical of many manufacturers in the state. State officials estimate there may be as many as a thousand unfilled jobs currently available in skilled trades. That's the picture for employers who need high school graduates. What about those companies looking for college grads with technical skills? I would say it is the most difficult time in over 15 years. It's just, just unbelievable. I've never seen the lack of you know, qualified people. That's Mark Richards, who runs a recruitment firm in Shelton called E. Richards Consulting. Last year, he had more than 40 vacancies from client companies for IT professionals that he couldn't fill. And you have a major th a trend in this, this country where kids don't go for a computer science degree and don't see the being a geek of a field they wanted to go into. So what has happened in this state, the home of Eli Whitney, Frederick Stanley and Igor Sikorsky? Professor David Fearon of Central Connecticut State University says the decline has been decades in the making. Right up until about 63 or 64, Connecticut was one of those locales that had lots and lots of firsts. What the heck happened after 62? Um, where are the people who can create the first? And why not here? I'm Diane Orson. Susan Palisano spends a great deal of time pondering that very question and how to solve it. She's the Director of Education and Training for the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology. Palisano says the problem starts early, way back in elementary school. Our kids actually do well in math and science up until about the fourth grade. We begin a gradual decline and a slope that uh, increases in its angle. And by the time our students are in 12th grade, they have fallen woefully behind on a global arena from other students. Susan Palma of the Education Connection in Litchfield works with teachers on ways to improve math and science education. She says a fundamental shift needs to take place in American attitudes toward the study of math and science. You never hear someone say, I'm not good at reading, but you often hear that I'm not good at math or I was never good at science. And that has a real impact the way our culture views mathematics and science. Palma says research shows the human brain more easily grasps math concepts than even learning to read. But much of the way math is taught leaves kids feeling unengaged. Jack Hammer entered teaching after a career as a computational chemist at a drug discovery company. He's now a high school chemistry teacher in the Milford Public Schools. As science teachers, maybe we need to do a better job of communicating the excitement of the process of science. You know, when you look at a lot of the science curricula at the high school level, we're telling them a lot about the results of science, but we're not really getting them engaged in the process of science, doing more scientific thinking, you know, uh, adopting more habits of mind of a working scientist. I'm Nina Satija. That's exactly what Yale professor Joe Handelsman believes needs to happen at the college level as well. According to a recent report Handelsman helped author for President Obama, 
If science and math departments can't retain more college students, the country will face a shortage of a million STEM workers in the next decade. In this country, 60% of the students who start out as science majors end up in the social sciences or humanities. So um, clearly, we're not keeping the people who even initially think they're interested in science, we're not keeping them interested. Last year, Handelsman founded the Yale Center for Scientific Teaching with the goal of training a new generation of graduate students to become better teachers in the STEM areas. She wants to keep more students in science. But she also wants students who aren't ultimately science majors to leave college with a respect for the subject. That, she says, could revolutionize attitudes about science and the STEM industry in this country. For WNPR, I'm Nina Satija. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that many of the nation's fastest growing and highest paid jobs require training in science, technology, engineering, and math also known as the STEM fields. But in Connecticut, an estimated 1,000 manufacturing jobs remain unfilled because applicants lack the skills they need. Many middle and high school students seem to lose interest in studying STEM subjects. For the second report in our series, WNPR's Diane Orson explores why. 16-year-old Charlotte Harrison says she's always liked math. In math, there are usually multiple ways of doing things, and you can discover them for yourself. But that's not how she feels about science. Everyone else has already discovered everything. You just have to memorize it. She's not alone. Jack Hammer teaches high school chemistry in Milford. At the start of this school year, he asked students if they were looking forward to chemistry. Out of 80 kids, maybe one answered that they were really looking forward to chemistry. <laughs> Hammer entered teaching a few years ago after working as a computational chemist in a drug discovery lab. He says he finds two competing philosophies about how to teach science. One camp will say, well, you've got to learn a lot of the basics before you can actually do some science. But then there's another camp, which I think is more persuasive to me personally. If you get kids doing science, even if it's fairly simple at first, you will capture their imagination. Data show that American kids actually do well in math and science in the early years. But achievement and interest start to fall after fourth grade, drop precipitously in eighth, and plummet in twelfth. Every four years, nations around the world participate in the Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study, or TIMS. The U.S. ranks well below places like Hong Kong, and as an example of why, Susan Palma with Litchfield's Education Connection says there are differences in the way the two countries teach math. We cover every standard that is tested on the TIMS test, and Hong Kong covers 50%. She describes the American approach to math education as broad and shallow, whereas Hong Kong takes a narrow and very deep dive approach. Palma says sometimes less is more. If you dig deep and teach a student in mathematics about a rectangle and all the, the attributes of a rectangle, parallel lines and the angles, and those concepts apply to all shapes in geometry. So once you know how it works in the most basic shape, you apply it to a square, you apply it to a trapezoid. And in the process, learn to make connections and figure out how to solve problems. American schools also tend to teach math and science separately from technology and engineering. That bothers Susan Palisano, Director of Education and Training for the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology. She travels around the state promoting STEM education and would like to see a more integrated approach. Science and math are the theoretical components. Technology and engineering are the applied components. And if you look at it that way and you think about how you can contextualize science and math. STEM really is how it is supposed to be done. And by doing that, she says, American students would have an easier time making that crucial connection between what they're learning in the classroom and what it might mean for them in real life. Because as kids get older, they begin to think of what they're going to be when they grow up. And if you don't see how math and science fits into your life, to me, that's the explanation for why we lose kids. Connecticut is home to a handful of specialty schools that focus on STEM education. 15-year-old Robert Folsom attends New Haven's Engineering and Science University Magnet School. He says he wants to be a mechanical engineer when he grows up, but still has to grapple with being labeled a science nerd. I'm there for a reason, because this is my field. 
and most people would be like, oh, wow, you go to an engineering science school. In their heart, they know that, wow, he must be smart. A study released last year by the National Research Council urges school districts to consider different educational models, but finds that good quality programs in traditional schools are equally as effective as specialty STEM programs. The report also identifies key elements in successful STEM education, including teachers who understand how to teach it well, adequate instructional time, and access to STEM learning opportunities for traditionally underserved students. For WNPR, I'm Diane Orson. Connecticut employers say students in the state aren't coming into the workforce with the skills they need in science, technology, engineering, and math. In part, that's because more than half of students who enter college thinking about a science major end up leaving the sciences before they graduate. In the third segment of our series on STEM education in Connecticut, WNPR's Nina Satija reports on efforts to change that. Every Thursday morning at 9.30, about a dozen students at the University of Connecticut head over to the Torrey Life Sciences Building for a three-hour anatomy and physiology lab. On a recent Thursday, they dissect and kill anesthetized frogs, cutting out their hearts and examining how they work. The biological science major is hard work, says UConn junior Alex Gomez. But now that he's managed to get through the intro biology classes into a laboratory setting like this one, he's starting to really enjoy it. At first, the general like, classes are more difficult, but then as far as you start doing more involved experiments, you start kind of experiencing what more science is really about. I mean, you get to start dissecting hearts, like, like frogs and, and cats, and you start, you know, thinking about you know, what processes are really going on. Science is a popular subject at the University of Connecticut, but many students describe their experience in a similar way as Gomez. Slog through the boring introductory lecture courses, and eventually you'll be rewarded with more fun activities like involved experiments. Yale professor Joe Handelsman thinks it shouldn't be that way, and that teaching methods are largely to blame. We're really misrepresenting science in our introductory courses and turning people off to it because they think it's something that it's not. A lot of rote memorization, uh, a lot of information and content and not uh, conceptual thinking, and not a lot of scientific thinking. Handelsman recently founded the Yale Center for Scientific Teaching. The center trains graduate students on better methods for teaching science, and it also hosts a summer institute for professors and lecturers every year. Xin Yan Chen, an assistant professor in residence at UConn, attended the institute recently and has since completely changed the way she approaches teaching. I noticed that uh, to be a good teacher, you will have to um, think about the way students learn. That wasn't Chen's focus before she attended the summer institute. She was only concerned that her lectures were easy to understand and students thought the exams were fair. Now she's focusing on whether her lectures actually motivate students to care about the subject. In order to engage them during lecture, she gave students clickers they can all use to answer a question she might pose. In an 8 a.m. class with 300 students, it's made a world of difference. They told me in my evaluation that um, those activities keep them awake. They really like them. Chen also asked students to answer questions on their own in small groups, another technique she learned from the Yale Center for Scientific Teaching. Stacy McGrath is a PhD student at Yale who participates in the center. There's data out there showing that if you take a group of students and you sort of pull them and ask them a question, and even if the entire class gets the answer wrong, if you let them discuss amongst themselves, they'll eventually get the answer right even without any sort of outside input. Unlike in Chen's class, where most students are biological science majors, most of the students in Handelsman's class are political science and economics majors. She's engaging them in scientific topics by having them discuss the implications of a bill going through Congress right now about antibiotic resistance. That's what students were debating in a recent discussion section of the class. They really said nothing about like, ways to enforce this, either like positive like, um, subsidies or negative like, punishments. There's hardly any incentive system or compliance system, I should say. Cole Weston is a junior economics major at Yale taking Handelsman's class. He likes it because he can apply his knowledge of economics to scientific topics. That's not true for most science courses, he says. So like most of the discussions you may have in, in your suites or uh, in your suites with your, with your roommates about whatever you learn in class today, you're not going to be dis debating chemistry or biology. You're talking about politics or like a new bill that was passed, etc. Handelsman is hoping that some of the younger students in her class will actually decide to go into the sciences. But she also wants the non-majors to leave college with the respect for the subject. Even if they leave, we think it's really important for them to understand the nature of science so that when they have to make a decision about taking a drug or not, 
or buying organic food or not, or making decisions that might affect global warming. They're understanding the process of how information that they're being asked to evaluate in order to make that decision, how that information was derived. Colleges don't even really need to convert lots of non-science majors, Handelsman says. They just need to retain more of the students who think they're interested in science to begin with. Right now, only 40% of those students end up with a science degree. Make that number 50%, and we'd be pretty close to the goal of producing nearly a million more college graduates with STEM degrees in the next decade. For WNPR, I'm Nina Satija. Connecticut students are falling behind in science, technology, engineering, and math. All this week, WNPR is examining the problem and its implications for our 21st century workforce. Today, Harriet Jones reports on efforts by employers to address the lack of STEM skills. Connecticut is facing a bizarre paradox. Despite chronically high unemployment, many companies in the state can't find workers to do the jobs they have available. According to Professor Susan Coleman of the University of Hartford, part of the reason is the game has changed. We're competing globally on the basis of being a knowledge economy. We're not doing labor-intensive types of tasks. We're not doing unskilled manufacturing. And she says trying to get out there in the knowledge economy without vital STEM skills is a losing strategy. I mean, it's like going into a sporting event with the wrong kind of equipment. You can be the best athlete on the field. But if you don't have the equipment, you're not going to be competitive. Some companies are finding the problem so acute, they're taking matters into their own hands. While these people are training, they still have to run their machines. They still have to get product out the door. Because this is Peter Paul Electronics, a manufacturing company in New Britain, where Human Resources Director Judy Spreda says the lack of basic math and problem-solving skills among job applicants makes hiring very difficult. This is our academy. There will be two or three times a day people sitting at all four stations. We Peter Paul has actually set aside a portion so of its shop floor space as a training center, the Peter Paul Academy, so that employees can brush up on basic skills while at work. I think we have nine people enrolled in a precision measurement for machinist course. We have um, probably ten people who are going to be taking the shop math class. One of those who's benefited from Peter Paul's proactive approach is Julio Reyes, who found his first job here, conditional on his completing the in-house training. And what has he learned most here in his first few months on the job? Basically a lot of math here. If you're going to work manufacturing, you got to know a lot of math. Yeah, I learned, I think, a lot more here than in school. It's a whole lot different. The problem of fostering homegrown talent is also on the mind of some of the state's biggest employers. This is Sikorsky Aircraft in Stratford. Bill Harris works for Sikorsky's Advanced Programs Unit. It takes us five to six years to get a guy ready to work on our product. The life cycle of our product is 50 years. So we need, when you come here to work, it really benefits us to have guys that want to stay 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 years. He says when he visits high schools, he sees the huge value in the linkage between the workplace and education. When you tell him you work you know, for a helicopter company, you work on something that flies, that's an automatic attraction. Harris is now heading up what the company is calling its STEM challenge, overseeing six high school teams who are competing to solve a real-world challenge. They're redesigning a part for the Connecticut Corsair, a 1930s aircraft that's being rebuilt with modern technology and materials. Harris says the whole idea is to turn kids on to the excitement of a career that uses STEM skills. Engineers love to, to do this. I have no trouble at all finding mentors finding people that will work on this, even on their own time. Well, the funny story is, is that they're very willing. They're just waiting for people to ask. Susan Palisano at the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology works with employers every day who want to get involved in the state's education system. But she says what's lacking is a coordinated approach. There are lots of great pockets of initiatives that happen here in Connecticut, but we're not a state that leverages best practices. Gary Zweifel agrees. Any educational program needs to have some involvement on the community side or the business side. Otherwise, how do you know if you're doing the right thing or not? Zweifel works for Delta Industries, a manufacturing company with 165 employees that makes jet engine parts for Pratt & Whitney. This company is uh, high-tech. takes us 
some of our parts as long as six weeks to make them, and uh, they, they could be worth over $100,000. So to put somebody coming in off the street that has no knowledge of it and, and to train them on the kind of stuff we do, it's a risk we don't want to take. For the last 14 years, Zweifel has been on the advisory board at Asnuntuck Community College, which runs one of the state's most successful manufacturing training centers. It goes a full year. It has not only machinist training, but math training, computer training, programming, safety, lean manufacturing, inspection. It's, it's got the whole array, all the kinds of things we need people to know before we bring them on board here. Companies like Swifels have a direct input into Asnuntuck's curriculum. The college's manufacturing center has a more than 90% graduation rate and almost all of its graduates already have a job lined up when they leave. The Malloy administration wants to clone the center at three other community colleges around the state. And that's the kind of initiative that Connecticut's employers are asking for. Judy Spreda at Peter Paul Electronics. I think we're finally starting to become aware in the state of Connecticut that, you know what, we kind of dropped the ball a little bit and we're starting to pick it up again. For WNPR, I'm Harriet Jones.